Hi, and welcome. My name is Doreen defaria Ye. I'm one of the cardiologists here in our cardiovascular disease and pregnancy program at Mass General Hospital, and I'm also an adult congenital heart disease doctor. It's such a pleasure to participate in the course uh, today and talk with you a little bit about the normal hemodynamics of pregnancy. I have no disclosures. We'll talk a little bit about um, normal findings today in pregnancy. If any of you have cared for women with cardiovascular disease who are pregnant, you know that pregnancy is such a dynamic state and changes in the body that occur on a week by week basis may cause some stress on the heart. It's really critically important that we as cardiologists understand normal, normal physiology, normal hemodynamics, normal physical exam findings so that we can potentially make a new diagnosis of cardiac disease in pregnancy if the pregnancy is unmasking cardiovascular symptoms and so that we can anticipate problems that may come later in the pregnancy. So understanding normal is really the key to allowing us to prevent maternal morbidity and mortality. Speaking of maternal mortality, we'll talk more about this later today, but over the decades from the 1950s to the 1980s, we saw a dramatic decline in maternal mortality as a result of reduction in maternal hemorrhage and infection and things that we could identify and treat. However, from the mid 1980s on, we noted that there was an increase in maternal mortality as things were slowly creeping up over time. Interestingly, if you superimpose these curves, as was published in the New England Journal in 1987, with some of our newer data through 2013, you'll see the average rates of maternal mortality have increased and brought us back to a place where we were maybe in the 1970s. Why is this? Well, many, many factors probably influence maternal morbidity and mortality, but one thing that we do know is cardiovascular disease is an important contributor to adverse events when it comes to um, pregnancy. When you look at maternal mortality rates ac across the world, many other countries have seen a decline in these rates in recent years, where unfortunately in the United States, we have seen an increase. Again, there are so many factors that probably play into why we are seeing an increase, but a few important considerations are the marked um, distinctions in race, where we see black and Hispanic women who have much higher rates of maternal mortality. Additionally, we may see women who come to pregnancy at an older age, and maybe as a result of in vitro fertilization, or women who come to pregnancy with a greater number of comorbid conditions like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and all of these things may play into why a woman may not do well around the time of pregnancy. In looking at all of the different contributors to maternal mortality and morbidity, cardiovascular disease remains an important contribution with an underlying cardiovascular disease, whether it's newly diagnosed in pregnancy or a history of underlying structural cardiac disease, cardiomyopathy, hypertensive disorders and related complica complications or cerebral vascular accidents account for about a third of the cases of maternal mortality. And so this is why it's critically important that cardiologists and obstetricians work together. It's critically important that cardiologists understand how to best and safely manage pregnant women um, to ensure that we help optimize the best outcomes. Interestingly, we've done a tremendous job improving rates of hypertension and hypertension-related uh, complications in pregnancy. Blood pressure is easy to measure and monitor during pregnancy. But unfortunately, what we have seen over time and over these decades is that there's been an increase in the number of women who have new diagnosis of cardiovascular disease or an underlying cardiovascular condition that gets unmasked during pregnancy and cardiomyopathy. And these have increased and probably contribute to some of the increased morbidity associated with cardiovascular complications in pregnancy. So let's talk a little bit about normal hemodynamics in pregnancy. We'll talk about blood pressure, heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, and we'll talk uh, briefly about twin pregnancies as well. We'll talk about intracardiac pressures during labor and delivery, and we'll talk about what happens in the postpartum period and when and how to anticipate problems that may arise postpartum. We'll also talk a little bit about normal symptoms and normal physical exam findings during pregnancy. And finally, how might all of these normal changes impact underlying cardiac disease? 
So when we think about the components of cardiac output, we think about heart rate and we think about stroke volume. I'm sure you will see these curves many times today. The increase in heart rate, as we see, is a change from baseline. So at this portion of the curve, we have pre-pregnancy. And as we move through the duration of the pregnancy, the postpartum period, we see the change, a positive change relative to pre-pregnancy values above this line and a negative change relative to pre-pregnancy values below this line. We see that heart rate slowly increases in the first 12 weeks gestation and then plateaus. And then we see another increase in the later portion of the third trimester, um, which peaks around the time of delivery and labor and contractions. Why is increase in heart rate important? Well, increasing our heart rate is one mechanism in which we can increase our cardiac output to provide more blood flow to that placenta and to the baby. With an increase in our heart rate also comes an increase in some normal extra heartbeats, premature atrial contractions, premature ventricular contractions. And as the body, the heart fills with more blood in a high plasma volume, a woman may feel the sensation of those extra heartbeats, um, particularly if they're in their left lateral position or laying quietly. And this sensation of palpitations can be entirely normal during pregnancy. An abrupt onset or abrupt offset of tachyarrhythmia or, or fast heartbeat is something that is not normal in pregnancy. And I always advise our woman, women to let me know if they have symptoms of abrupt onset, abrupt offset, because arrhythmias are more common during pregnancy, more common during times when the average heart rate is increased, like in the later third trimester, but can occur any time during pregnancy. So in order to increase our cardiac output, we increase our stroke volume by increasing our plasma volume. And as you see, this red line here slowly increases during the third trimester, oh, sorry, during the second trimester and peaks in the third trimester around 32 weeks. Now, what does this mean? More blood flow that's coming into the heart, expanding the heart size a bit. We see a slight increase in the chamber size, the, both ventricles and atria during pregnancy to accommodate this increased plasma volume. We bring the right ventricle a little bit closer to the sternum. And again, a reason why women may feel these extra, these normal extra premature atrial contractions or premature ventricular contractions and cause symptomatic palpitations. How does plasma volume increase? Well, we have an increase in plasma renin with a commensurate decrease in ANP. And this increased plasma volume really represents um, uh, underfilling due to systemic vasodilation and an increase in vascular expansion. So we have more venous capacitance rather than true blood volume expansion. And then our kidneys are exquisitely sensitive and physiologically regulate the amount of sodium um, that um, is, uh, is excreted. So with this increase in heart rate, this increase in plasma volume, we also see an increase in stroke volume and cardiac output. So this green line here represents our increase in cardiac output, which steadily increases to about almost 50% the pre-pregnancy values around 12 weeks. So many women may not be really even visibly pregnant at that point, but their heart is handling a significant increase in blood flow, an increase in heart rate, and is accommodated to an increased cardiac output at that point. So many, um, why increased cardiac output? Well, one is that mom and the placenta and baby really require quite a, bit of quite a bit of metabolic activity. So in order to do this, we increase our preload, we decrease our afterload and increase our heart rate. As I mentioned, normal increase in cardiac output is anywhere from 30 to 50% or up to about two liters um, per minute. With a twin pregnancy, we see an increase of additional 20% and that peaks a little bit earlier at about 30 weeks. Cardiac output and stroke volume can be impacted by posture where we see the highest um, stroke volume in the left lateral decubitus position as the uterus is turned away from the IVC and there's a significant increase in preload. And the ejection fraction over the course of the pregnancy should remain unchanged despite these um, alterations in plasma volume. This is a small schematic that was published in the 1970s that demonstrates, again, that increase in cardiac output when a woman is laying to her left side. This can be particularly important in our women who may have a preload-dependent 
underlying cardiovascular condition, such as a Fontan circulation, which is a single ventricle circulation that really relies on the preload of that blood flow getting to that single ventricle. And if women have symptoms of lightheadedness or dizziness or low output, we may have them uh, labor in their left lateral decubitus position. The other important thing that occurs is an increase in red blood cell mass. And this is to accommodate the increased oxygen demand that the body needs to supply the placenta and the baby. The red blood cell mass increases steadily over the course of the second trimester and peaks in third trimester. We see an increase in erythropoietin that allows for this. Some women um, who take iron supplements may see an even further increase, but women not taking iron supplements will see about a 15 to 20% increase. The rise in red blood cell mass, however, is less than the rise in plasma volume. So as you can imagine, the blood will get more dilute over time if there's more plasma than red blood cells. And what occurs there? The purple bar here denotes our hematocrit. And we see this normal physiologic reduction in hematocrit or physiologic anemia that occurs during pregnancy. This is critically important for several reasons because it reduces the blood viscosity and reduces the um, effort needed to, to perfuse the small arterioles within the placenta and allow for that increase in cardiac, uh, cardiac output. So the reduced blood viscosity is critically important, reducing resistance to flow and facilitating placental perfusion. Also reduces the work of the heart. So it's functionally afterload reducing um, the heart and allowing for the heart to accommodate to the higher stroke volume. This absence of this physiologic anemia actually could be quite harmful. And if you think of some of our women who have underlying congenital heart disease, cyanotic congenital heart disease, where they live with low oxygen levels and they require a secondary erythrocytosis and higher hematocrit to maintain their oxygen demands, these women may start off with a higher level of viscosity in their blood, and even a normal increase in that plasma volume may not allow them to achieve the um, appropriate reduction in viscosity to facilitate placental perfusion. As a result of this, women who have cyanosis may have a higher risk of stillbirth, preterm pre -term labor, and small babies for gestational age. Finally, post-delivery, as much as about a half a liter of blood can be sequestered in the uteroplacental unit and then auto-transfused back to the maternal circulation. So importantly, we see a reduction in the systemic vascular resistance in the second trimester, in the late first trimester, early second trimester, that occurs at a fairly rapid deceleration. This is, uh, occurs by many um, mechanisms. Why is this important? It again reduces the resistance of the, uh, to the utero uh, placental circuit, and it caused by an increase in endothelial prostacyclin and enhanced nitric oxide production, which both reduce arterial stiffness, and this is um, um, facilitated by relaxin. This is again another mechanism to offload, afterload, reduce the heart, and promote placental perfusion. So as we note this reduction in systemic vascular resistance, we have to consider what might this mean for a woman who has, for example, a patent atrial level shunt. It's possible that that reduction in systemic vascular resistance may in some circumstances promote right to left shunting through an atrial level defect. And it's possible that paradoxical embolization may occur around the time when there's a rapid dec decrease in the systemic vascular resistance. Interestingly, with all of these factors, this, this uh, pink line here is the systolic blood pressure. The blood pressure really does not change dramatically from pre-pregnancy values. It may reduce just a little bit as a function of the decline in systemic vascular resistance. But given there's a uh, commensurate increase in plasma volume, generally the systemic blood pressure remains fairly stable. Importantly, some women require uh, medication like beta blockers if they have an arrhythmia. And we, if a woman is volume replete in this state with a high plasma volume, we tend to not see much of a reduction in the blood pressure if they are taking medications that are vasoactive like 
beta blockade. So we often, we should not be afraid to start a medication that may have blood pressure lowering effects in a pregnant woman, woman knowing that if they are volume replete, it really shouldn't have much in the way of blood pressure lowering effects. That's not the case if a woman is hypertensive, of course, and then it is critically important to treat their blood pressure with medications that sufficiently lower um, the blood pressure and further vasodilate. This is a small schematic that uh, we put together a couple of years ago, Dr. Veen Yusel um, uh, here at MGH and myself looking at what happens postpartum. And you take all of these changes that we see um, in the peripartum period, delivery occurs, and then the postpartum period, many of these changes don't return back to normal until about three to six months postpartum. And for this reason, it's important that we follow these women closely in the postpartum period as they, as they may continue to have cardiovascular symptoms or um, uh, adverse outcomes related to those persistently altered hemodynamics. I tend to not repeat echocardiograms for pregnant women until about the six month or beyond postpartum period because we still may see some of those changes of increased plasma volume um, and, and, and mild increase in the cardiac chambers, mild increase in valvular regurgitation like tricuspider mitral regurgitation that can all be very normal in the, preg in the pregnant state and in the postpartum state. What about twin pregnancies? This is just a slide for your reference where we can see that there's even a further increase in the blood volume and the red blood cell volume um, and even a further decrease in the hematocrit. So the physiologic anemia may be even more pronounced. This is from an older study looking at two women who had PA catheters placed around the time of uh, labor and delivery. And as you can see below here, there's a tracing of uterine pressure. So this is like, I, I like to say an EKG of the uterus or uh, a, a measurement here of the uterine pressure. You can see this is during a time of contraction. And what happens to the intracardiac pressures during this time in these particular two women? You'll see that the central venous pressure and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure should be normal, five millimeters and five millimeters. With uterine contraction, we see an associated increase in these intracardiac pressures. So an increase in the right atrial pressure to about 20 millimeters of mercury, and an increase in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure to about 16 millimeters of mercury. Why is this important to know? So for women who have underlying cardiomyopathies or underlying cardiovascular conditions, it's critically important that as we manage them, that they are euvolemic entering into labor. If they enter into labor with an elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 18 or so, it very well may be that with labor and with uterine contraction, the pressures inside their heart may rise even further and may promote pulmonary edema or flash pulmonary edema. So ensuring euvolemia is a critically important goal of the cardiologist caring for a pregnant woman. Um, and then finally, there's a further increase in cardiac output during the second stage of labor and delivery. Pain increases, the heart rate increases, the, there's an increase in peripheral vasoconstriction and arterial blood pressure. I always tell women that managing pain around the time of labor and delivery is a critically important part of their cardiovascular management because reducing some of these triggers, heart rate and blood pressure for a woman with underlying cardiovascular disease can be of critically important benefit. So pain management um, is uh, very important. These expectations in this management plan should be discussed in advance with women. As you can imagine, there's a lot of anxiety that may come around the time of labor and delivery for any woman, even without cardiac disease, never mind if there is a superimposed concern about their cardiovascular health. So our group comes together um, regularly with our obstetricians, our maternal fetal medicine doctors, cardiologists, anesthesiologists, our nursing team, our trainees who may be involved. And we all talk about what are the possible issues that could arise around the time of labor and delivery. And importantly, how are we best prepared to manage each one of those unique situations? What might be the situations that we would uh, think about uh, suppressing heart rate or blood pressure or so forth to keep um, a woman's heart healthy? Lastly, after delivery, we can't forget there are so many important changes hemodynamically that can occur postpartum. This is a diagram that demonstrates many of these parameters. We've talked about heart rate, cardiac output, blood pressure, but I'll 
draw your attention to the systemic vascular resistance, the closed dark circles here. This is postpartum day one through 10 and postpartum week 12 through 24. You can see within this first week postpartum, there's a fairly rapid increase in the systemic vascular resistance. This is a really important hemodynamic um, normal finding to know about. You can imagine some women who have underlying cardiovascular conditions that are afterload dependent may really appreciate the significantly afterload reduced state that they live in during pregnancy. And it may not be until the postpartum period where there's a fairly rapid rise in that systemic vascular resistance, that increased pressure that comes to the heart fairly acutely in those postpartum days that then may unmask their underlying cardiomyopathy or increase the degree of mitral regurgitation that they may have that then may promote pulmonary edema. This is a very important concept when we think about managing women with peripartum cardiomyopathy and low ejection fractions who may do very well during the pregnancy, during delivery, but then in the postpartum period may start to notice symptoms of orthopnea or pulmonary edema or dyspnea and may require diuretics at that point. And this is the normal hemodynamics that we need to understand and, and think about blaming for that. Additionally, remember that there is an autotransfusion to the maternal circulation that only further increases um, the, the, the plasma volume that can also contribute to unmasking heart failure in the postpartum setting. So often it's very, um, uh, uh, it, it, it seems as though we should feel um, uh, uh, relief that the baby is delivered and out and everything's all set. But often, I sometimes worry most about those first few days in the postpartum period, particularly for women who have low ejection fraction, ensuring that they're not discharged from the hospital um, too early, that we sort of observe their hemodynamics in those first few postpartum days to ensure that they are safe um, to go home. So normal symptoms of pregnancy, if anybody out there's been pregnant, I should disclose I've been pregnant three times and each pregnancy was quite different. You all know that breathlessness and easy fatigability is universal for every woman um, who is pregnant. Why is this? There are many, many factors. Maybe some are related to um, mechanical factors in the uterus, compressing components of, of the lung tissue, but more likely this is related to hormonal effects and progesterone that may contribute to dyspnea. So how do we tease out what dyspnea may be normal during pregnancy versus what may be abnormal? That can be tricky and really requires a careful and detailed history and also supplementing an evaluation potentially with some objective markers, potentially use of uh, BNP or an echocardiogram, or um, uh, if there's significant concern considering a right heart catheterization, all of that is very, very rarely ever needed. Palpitations, as I mentioned, are also fairly universal given the increase in the resting basal heart rate that occurs, the increase in the size of the heart and the RV particularly that comes to the sternum, making us much more aware of the heart sensation. Um, and then also mild peripheral edema that often is uh, mechanical and maybe some compression of venous return by the gravid uterus to the IVC. Our cardiac physical exam, you'll hear that the heart rate is increased um, and that is, can be normal. The arterial pulse will be brisk with a very rapid collapse. You may auscultate a venous hum, and I often advise our fellows to put your stethoscope right up against the clavicle, um, and you may hear sort of this increased flow through the innominate vein. There may, there usually and often is a systolic ejection murmur. It should be early peaking with a rapid deceleration, and there should be no diastolic component. The JVP can be very conspicuous, particularly in the later portions of pregnancy, with a very brisk, brisk S, um, X and Y descent, and sometimes A waves may be more obvious. So you may see that jugular venous waveform just has more notable and sharp, distinct um, features. It should maintain that biphasic waveform, and importantly, the mean venous pressure should remain normal. That's critically important. The JVP should not elevate in a normal pregnancy. Heart sounds and closures will be more prominent. You may hear wide, wider splitting of the second heart sound as a result of that increased um, plasma volume to the right ventricle. A physiologic third heart sound can be quite normal. And we hear that often in later stages. You may bring that out by bringing a woman to a left lateral 
to keep its position. And the point of mass will intentionally be larger. In reality, it can be difficult to palpate because also the breast tissue will be increased as well. Diastolic murmurs truly are never normal. And if you hear a diastolic murmur in pregnancy, that has to be something that is evaluated. So in summary, pregnancy is a hemodynamic and physiologic stress test for the heart. We have to think carefully about if a woman has known cardiac disease, will their ventricular reserve tolerate this increased volume load, this increased plasma volume, this increased heart rate? Will their uh, mechanical obstruction tolerate a pressure load and allow for that augmentation of the stroke volume to the and, and cardiac output to this placenta, such as aortic stenosis, for example? Will tachycardia trigger arrhythmia? Often, cardiac disease can be unmasked in weeks 28 through 32 because that's often where we see the peak of the heart rate, the peak of the plasma volume, the peak of the cardiac output. And so um, I always will see women with a known concern about cardiac disease around this time to examine them and ensure that they're remaining euvolemic during this time. Understanding these hemodynamic changes um, and, and arrhythmic risks, myocardial risk, is really critically important to predicting what problems may happen and when those problems may occur and communicating your concern about that risk to your multidisciplinary care team is critically important. So together you can devise a plan about how to address any of those issues if they were to arise, well documented in the chart. So there's no surprises when the woman comes in for labor and ensure the healthy um, success of um, both mom and baby. And then importantly, understanding normal symptoms in pregnancy, dyspnea, palpitations, edema, when not to evaluate unnecessarily, but importantly, when not to miss the early symptoms of underlying cardiac disease if it's being manifest with these symptoms. Finally, hemodynamic shifts are not over when the baby is out. Remember that postpartum increase in the systemic vascular resistance that can unmask cardiomyopathies, heart failure, so important to predict and ensure that we're not um, discharging women prematurely before some of those changes have occurred. This is all I have. Um, my last slide uh, just has contact information here. If you were to have any questions, I'm always very happy to field questions via email or my um, office phone number is there as well. Thank you so much for attending this course. I look forward to seeing you later and answering any questions that you have.